Go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to the book of Ephesians. Eventually, we're going to read from the book of Ephesians. Matter of fact, I'm going to start in chapter 6, verse 10, the same place we started last week, and then we'll jump to chapter 1 as well. We know that God's given us a word at Life Church for this year. It's three words that make a phrase. Life Church folk tell everybody else that's gathering online. Maybe they're new here and they don't know what it is. But if you've been here since the second Sunday of this year, you know what it is. Are you ready? One, two, three. Press new weight. Press new weight. And uh, so we've been leaning into what God is speaking to us about press new weight all year and last week I began a message that I thought I was going to get through in one week and now I realize I'm not even going to get through it in two weeks so hopefully we'll finish it off in three weeks and uh, it's called press into grace somebody shout grace thank you I mean shout grace like you're really thankful for it (laughs) hallelujah I Know that the command that we have in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, and I use that word very intentionally, is Paul, after writing to the church at Ephesus, he gets to the end of what we call the chapter, but he's very near the end of his letter, his epistle. And in verse 10, we read that it says, finally, like I've said everything up until now to say this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might be strong I am so thankful he didn't say be as strong as you can be I don't know if you found it yet but I found the end of my strength and one of the most freeing things that we can do as believers is find the end of our strength because when we find the end of our strength we've just begun to tap into the beginning of his strength the Bible says let the weak say I'm strong. The Bible says in our weakness, his strength is made complete, is made perfect. How many of you are thankful for his perfect, complete strength, that which is being completed in you? So be strong. I'm glad it didn't say be strong in your strength because I know mine doesn't last very long. But we can actually find a place in God where we can be strong and keep getting stronger because that's the tense of the verb in the strength of his might because there's no limit and there's no end to his strength because just when you think you found the greatest thing you've only found another thing in God because he's eternal and his strength knows no end (sighs) so we can be positioned in a place That we can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I believe what Paul writes in his epistle up until there are, I'm going to say the important techniques. I I hate to use the word techniques when it comes to spiritual things. But if you'll just let, let me humor myself, if not you, for just a minute and relate it like I did last week to, to lifting weights that, that, uh, if you don't use the right technique, you'll never realize the full potential that you have. Because the right technique actually positions you to press new weight. If I'm leaning too far forward, I won't access all the strength that's available to me. But if I learn the technique of the right position, the right posture, and the right form, I'll access every bit of strength that's within my capacity to press weight that I've never pressed before. And the more weight I learn to press, the more weight I'll be able to press. That means I can actually move in God from one personal record to another personal record. From, from one one rep max to a couple weeks later, I got a bigger one rep max. That's weightlifting terminology for those of you that don't know. So, so that's God's design for believers. I just need to know. I, I need to make sure you really believe that today. I, I, do you believe there's more available to you than what you've accessed in God that the great things he's done in you and through you, come on, are just a foretaste of what he wants to continue to do. I don't care if you're eight days old in God or you're 80 years old in God. 
whatever he's done up until now pales in comparison to what he still can do because there's no end to the strength of his might. So he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And he says that at the end and all the way through Ephesians, he begins to unfold, I believe, what the technique, what the form, what the posture is and how we can access the strength that is available in God so that we can press new weight. And this is, remember, Paul writing, who we like to call the apostle of what? Grace, right? Like he, every book, he unfolds something about grace. I mean, you won't find one of his epistles that he doesn't touch on this incredible subject of grace because I believe the technique of grace is the key to us being positioned to press new weight. And if we'll learn how to press into grace, then we'll be positioned to press weight we've never pressed before. But we'll be able to press the weight of whatever it is God brings before us, the weight of whatever happens in culture, and the weight of whatever God calls us to do, because we will be rightly positioned in grace. Somebody shout grace. Now, last week we defined grace, our working definition, because we've heard in the church world, a lot of definitions, and not that there's anything wrong with them. I just have one that, that, that I believe is more complete than others because we've heard that it's, you know, God's unmerited favor. Yes, it is. And we've heard that it's uh, getting what we don't deserve, right, what we didn't earn. Yes, that's true. But my working definition and our working definition for this message is this, that it's divine enablement. It is the empowerment of God available to us for whatever is needed in the moment and for whatever it is that God has asked us slash required us to do. Does anybody believe God still requires his people to do some things? Amen. And last week we, we learned about the glory of his grace. Matter of fact, let's just read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, and we're going to pray and keep moving so that Alan can sit down and rest a minute. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. Is anybody glad that before the foundation of the world, God already had in mind that Gentiles would have adoption made available to them? That was already predetermined in God. According to the good pleasure of his will, just because it made him happy, because that's what pleased him, to the praise of the glory or the weight of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Father, thank you for your word today as we continue to lean into this message. I ask, Holy Spirit, that as I give voice to your word, that you'll be the teacher, instructor, and trainer of hearts as the word makes entrance into hearts and lives. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Somebody said, amen. Amen. So by his glorious grace, by the glory, the weight of his grace come on by grace we've been saved through faith come on help me preach everybody if i leave a pause which occasionally i'll do i know i'm known for talking fast but occasionally i will pause then you can help me preach right there all right so by grace you've been saved through are you glad that you come to jesus that what's impossible for man God made possible, and that divine enablement brought you to the place of salvation. Are you thankful for that? So literally, by His grace, we have been accepted, not on accordance to what you did, because you were lost in sin. You were dying on your way to hell, doing what you wanted to do, however you wanted to do it, whenever you wanted to do it, because you didn't know any better. Right? Because sin makes you stupid. Come on, are you with me? Come on. I said sin makes you stupid. You lose all reasoning power. Just look what's happening in the earth today. Cognitive dissonance everywhere. It's the result of sin. Amen. Praise Jesus. I better keep moving or I'll get a soapbox right there. So, so, by grace we have been accepted. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. Right? But by grace, he made it us able. There was a divine enablement for us to be accepted in God. So therefore, grace 
is opposed to works in order for you to be accepted. It's all his divine enablement. And once you come to the place of acceptance in the beloved, though, grace is opposed to works there, but not opposed to effort from acceptance. I'm saying it this way. It's opposed to work for acceptance. Are y'all with me this morning? But that's why, because it's this afternoon, not this morning. Are y'all with me this afternoon? All right. Opposed to work for acceptance, but not opposed to effort from acceptance. Because grace, we learned last week, we don't want to confuse with mercy. Mercy is needed when somebody has sinned. S-I-N. Well, Pastor Ryan, I'm a believer. I don't sin. That's right. Believers don't practice sin. And we still sin. Uh, no, Pastor Ryan, I don't sin. I mess up. I make mistakes. I slip. Yeah, dress it up however you want. When we miss the mark in God, it's still called S-I-N. Somebody say that word for me. Yeah, because if you don't call a thing what it is, you'll never deal with it the way it is. So sometimes there is freedom in just calling something that is what it is. That's called truth that makes you free. Because if as long as, you know, I just keep messing up or slipping up, then you'll never be motivated to find the grace to walk out from under what the real issue is. And it's not just an issue. It's called... Oh, there you got it. I paused and you figured it out. That's good. It's still called sin. Right? Are, are, are we doing okay? We haven't lost anybody yet. And when we sin, what's needed is mercy. Because God's mercy is extended towards us so that we don't receive the judgment that our sin deserves. Because that was actually unleashed upon Christ at the cross. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin, the Bible says, became sin for us. For us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what the book of Romans says. Is anybody glad about that? Right? So he became sin for us. So when I sin, it's not that there's, oh, it's okay, because there's grace for that. No, no. When we sin, there's mercy for that. Before we sin, there's grace for that. So that I don't have to go there. Those are the things we talked about last week. And can we just keep building on it this week? Because God's designed that the way we live actually brings praise to the glory of his grace. How I many you know in verse 6 there he said to the praise of the glory of his grace. That, that not just the declaration of by grace through faith have we been saved. But the walking out of that salvation, come on, displays something about the glory of his grace. And he gets the praise for it. That's God's design, not just for our believing, but for our living. For our not just believing that it's possible, but that what we believe is possible, we actually are empowered by grace to live out and walk out. Because as much as Paul talks about grace, if you look in his letters, he also talks about how that grace, what it looks like when it's lived out. Because he talks about our walk as much as he talks about our position in Christ. He talks about our condition, not just our position. Amen? So... We looked at the glory of his grace. Let's let's now finally get to another verse. Let's go to verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1. Is everybody still with me? In him, we have redemption through his blood. We're going to celebrate his blood in just a minute. The forgiveness of sins according or to the measure. Oh. In equal proportion to, how I many you know that's what that means? Let's just back up. In him, what do we have? 
redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins to the measure or to the extent to the same proportion of the riches that word riches there means abundance that word means preeminence it's not just about i got a lot of stuff it it, it actually conveys the idea of abundance through the abundance of his grace and if that isn't good enough he goes on in the next phrase and says which he made abound toward us so the abundance of this divine enablement is not just there but he causes it to abound or literally to be in excess to superabound exceeding a number or measure I'm about to run around this room today because he didn't just say it's available but he's positioned come on because of Christ us to be recipients of the riches the abundance of his grace that is impossible to measure it's a throwing beyond an extravagant exaggeration of an abundance that already exists it's powerful So it's not just the weight of his grace, but the abundance. So Paul is setting up his letter, letting us know that this glorious grace is also towards us in an exceedingly abundant way. So you know what he's doing right at the beginning? He's letting us know that there's no reason for us to live up under sin when there's an abundance of grace already Towards us. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. How many know he said in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. So it's important for us to know. That however we came to him. It's the same way we live in him. We came to the cross. And receive what Jesus... Is anybody thankful for what Jesus did at the cross? We came to the cross and we received the completed work there. By grace, God made it possible, divine enablement. Accessed by the belief in our heart. Remember that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what happened. Totally what God did. From then on, guess how we continue to live from the cross? By grace, through faith. Nothing changes except that we've changed. Are you see that? The same way we got there is the same way we live from there. The difference is, is we have now a new nature. Which is incredibly important because the new nature now says... That I'm not who I used to be. Now, there is not a sin nature working in me. There's a God nature working in me. Some people say you're struggling with the sin nature. That died at the cross. That's who you used to be. That's not who you are. Well, Pastor Ryan, why do I still have issues? Sin. Because there's something still being worked out of the way your mind was trained to behave in a certain way so that you live according to the way you have been recreated in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. How many of you know his body didn't die? The sin nature died. And now he lived to God in Christ Jesus. Somebody ought to get excited. So, this powerful grace, the riches, the riches of His grace are so, so amazing. So powerful. Yet, it actually requires our effort. I didn't say works, I said effort. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. Are y'all still with me? Because what am I doing? I'm teaching you how to press new weight this year. Does anybody want to? All right. uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. 
Again, this is still Paul writing now to the church at Corinth, the apostle of grace, right? He says, we then, as workers, together with him, also plead. In other words, we beg with everything that's in us. I'm trying to get your attention. Pay attention because what I'm about to say is really important. Hello, I need you to hear this. Ryan Deaton's amplified version. I plead with you not to receive the grace of God that he said to the church at Ephesus is glorious and comes to us in riches and abundance and it super abounds towards us. And not to receive it in vain. The word vain there in the Greek, it means fruitless, it means empty, it means with no effect. So let's pause for a minute. If he says, I urge you not to receive it in vain, then that would say it's actually possible for us to have received it and it not produce anything in us. I I know that's just just like reasoning, right? The way it's written. If he says, "I, I urge you, I plead with you, don't receive it in vain. That means it's actually possible to have been a recipient of the grace of God and it not have God's desired effect in our lives to the point where there's actually no fruit coming from the riches and the glory of the grace that he made abound to us. My goodness, that's not what I want. When I know that grace was paid for with such a great price, it was so costly that it cost the life of Jesus himself when he gave himself on the cross at Calvary. I don't want to receive it in vain. I don't want to receive it in vain. I want it to produce something. Do you want it to produce something? He goes on and says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, Right here, he's quoting from the Old Testament. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. And then he says this, Behold, now is the accepted time, or the acceptable time, or is the kairos moment. Behold, now. When? When? And if you read it tomorrow, when? And if you read it on Friday, when? Is the day of salvation. That means whenever you read that or realize it, like every moment is The day of salvation. I asked this question in the first service. I'm going to ask it in this service because when we think of the day of salvation, for some of you, there'll be a date that pops up in your mind. How many of you know the date that you gave your heart and your life to Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. Like you can say it in my spiritual. Some of you say, well, my spiritual birthday is. Raise your hand if you know. All right. Y'all are holier than me. Raise your hand if you don't know. Wow. I look at that. In this service, there's more that don't know than do know. Maybe we better we need to make sure here before we leave. <laughs> I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard well-meaning religious people say, if you don't remember the day, then you better give your heart to Jesus today because if you gave your heart to Jesus, you would remember the day. And I'm thinking, I was too young to remember the day. <laughs> and that's all right. Right? And, 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 and <laughs> you know, there, there was a day in church where we like to parade testimonies, right? There were testimonies that were more powerful than others, right? So like the worse worse heathen you were, the greater your testimony was. How do you remember those days in church? Come on. We can laugh about it a little bit, right? Like we never heard the ones like, I've just been serving Jesus all my life. Nobody clapped about that. Man, you get somebody up here that they were strung out on drugs and they were addicted to this, that, and the other and they had tried to kill five people and they were in a gang and this, that, and the other. They're like, oh, thank God for their testimony, Jesus. (laughs) And then good church folk, good church brats, right? Good kids that grew up in church, they thought, well, I better go work on my testimony. (laughs) And they worked hard on their testimony, man. And then it was like, oh, yeah, they got to be rebellious. They got to go sow their wild oats. And meanwhile, us that never worked on that kind of testimony, we're like. I I go go on missions trips. I remember the first missions trip we ever went on. Bless everybody's heart that thought this. You had to share your testimony. And I'm like 18, 19 years old. I'm old enough to know better. I'm thinking, I ain't got no testimony. I got no testimony. I never did drugs. 
I never drank. I never, I never smoked, drank, or chew, or went with women that did. And it was like this when you're going to, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do. And I'm thinking, why would you ever want to kiss a girl that had been chewing? That's just nasty. Are we doing all right? We're having too much fun in church. So, so, so they'd go work on their testimony, right? So they could get saved and have a date. Because today's the day of salvation. And we would celebrate the grace that saved people out of things. And neglect the grace that saved people from things. So therefore, when we came to Christ, we would always be looking for grace to save us out of something. And not realize that grace is now in operation after the cross to save us from something. That's the power and that's the message of grace. The message of grace is not, oh, I messed up. That's okay. There's grace for that. The message of grace is he's able to keep me from sinning. He's able to keep me from falling. How many of you know the apostle John? In 1 John, he writes these things and he gets to the end. He says, beloved, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And we live in our culture today and we think, oh, you know, I'm going to sin. But that's okay. There's grace for that. Now, I don't want people to live up under religious bondage that we got to perform in a certain way and God's going to be mad at us if we don't. I'm thinking what's available to us in the terms of pressing new strength if we'll learn to access the grace of God to live in a way that represents the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I say, so, so, so what would be possible is to hear me and feel condemned this morning or to feel shamed this morning. And I don't want that because the message of grace is empowering. The message of grace is freeing. Not because it lowers the standard, but it lets you know that God's there working in you so that you can come up to the standard in Him and that He's working with you in the process so that you don't receive the grace of God in vain. And it produced nothing beyond just being saved. And that's part of the problem. We've been content with preaching a salvation that gets us into heaven. And not a gospel that helps us experience the kingdom. Because Jesus didn't just die for us to when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Some of y'all don't know that song. Right? <laughs> or some glad morning when this life is o'er. Fly away. I got them all, man. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just like, that's so short of the reason Jesus died. Just for us to get to heaven. Rather, it's so we could experience abundant life here and now. So that whatever was happening in the filthiness of culture, we would find grace to stand up under that weight and not be moved by culture, but rather demonstrate kingdom living in the midst of a culture that's full of sin, that's controlled by the prince of the power of the air, by the spirit of him who works in the sons of disobedience. So that we can manifest the life of a son and daughter of God. Hallelujah. So don't receive it in vain. And he, he keeps going through chapter 6 and he gets to chapter 7 verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. Are we still there? Y'all with me still? And he says, therefore. I've, no, <laughs> you know what? Let's back up just a minute because this is too good. My eyes just caught that. Here's the verses right before, right? So he's talking about receiving the grace of God in, in vain in verse 1. And in, in verse 17 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Whoo, shoot. <laughs> Snap. We're getting serious now. Separation. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 
Wait a minute. This is the apostle of grace, Pastor Ryan. Yeah, exactly, church. Exactly. It's the power of grace to bring us out, to live separate, to be separate. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for grace. Therefore, verse, chapter 7, verse 1, having these promises, beloved, loved one, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Well, that's an unpopular verse in church today. Remember, it's opposed to works, not effort. So in other words, if you receive the grace of God in vain and you don't get to chapter 7 and verse 1 and find the way to do what it asks for, then all the power that's of grace that's lavished upon you and all of its riches and all of the way it has abounded towards us could be in vain because he says, therefore, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and, and perfect holiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the Greek. Uh, one version says completion. In the Greek, it means to accomplish fully. To accomplish fully. Just pause there. To accomplish fully. The holiness and the fear of God. That's the New Testament. That's the new covenant of grace. Not laid out as a law, but saying, here's what grace does. It actually empowers you to come to the place that the salvation that has been worked in you is worked through you and out of you so that holiness is completed. How many know Paul wrote this? Oh, man. What did he write? It is God who works in you. Who works in me? Both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Right? God works in you. God works salvation and holiness in you. Right? Hallelujah. Then he goes on and says, therefore, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the process of cleansing ourselves, finding grace to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh so that holiness is completed in our lives. So when he says today is the day of salvation, he's not talking about the day you were born again. He's talking about every day when temptation comes. There's grace to make that the day of salvation, not out of, but from. So that means, guess what? Not just Sunday can be a day of salvation because I was in church and we did all the holy stuff. But Monday, when my boss aggravates me and I want to get angry and let everybody in the office know about it. It's not just an issue. There's grace to keep me from being angry and sinning. Or, when I'm tempted to go on those websites, I can find grace to complete holiness in the fear of God. And that becomes my day, and you save me from that today again. And we mark today, and Friday, and Saturday, and every day. That means every day can be another day of salvation, because God is not always, he's already saved us out of things, and now his grace works to save us from things. Hallelujah. His grace works to save us out of addiction, to save us out of patterns and habits of sin. And while we're at it, I think I ought to lean into this subject for just a minute. I got so much stuff that's not in my notes today, I could preach for another five hours. <laughs> How about this subject? I just feel like I need to bring some context to a subject that's been in the body of Christ for 
a long time because I think the way it has existed promotes us uh, approaching it from the wrong place that's not doctrinally accurate. And if it's not doctrinally accurate, then what happens is we'll develop a lifestyle that's not biblically correct. Right? So it might sound like semantics. It's actually not. It's something that's very important. So how many of you have heard of this idea of generational curses? Raise your hand. Almost, look at everybody, almost everybody, right? Good. So there's nothing biblically wrong with the idea. But the terminology is not biblical. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says about Jesus, well, it says this in the Old Testament, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's what the Old Covenant said, right? And then, then Jesus hung on a tree. And it says he, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. One version says, one verse says he became a curse for us. In other words, he was cursed, so I am not. That means before I come to the cross of Calvary, there may have been generational curses operating in my family for God knows how many generations. But when I come to the cross, that curse has to stay at the cross, and I move forward with that curse broken. Because wait, 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 why is that so important? But here, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you why that's so important. If I think of it as a curse, here's what happens. I live as a victim of what I can't control. But when I understand that the cross is more powerful than the curse, I can live responsibly finding grace to walk out from under the strongholds that existed in my family for a long time. Did you catch that? Because, because there is no curse more powerful than the cross. I just got to lean into this. So when I come to the cross, I don't care what my daddy did. I don't care what my granddaddy did, what his granddaddy did, or what their granddaddy did. I don't care how long it's been a cycle in my family. That curse is broken at the cross. And... I then must train my mind. I must be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I've got to renew my mind so I think differently so that the thought that ultimately created the behavior that's been passed down from generation to generation doesn't exist as a stronghold in my life so that I'm actually free. Let me put it this way. Let me put it another way. At the cross, listen, we're not trying to break chains after the cross. They're broken at the cross. What I have to do is discover how to walk away from the chains that are already broken. Because at the cross, they don't have me any longer. I just need to learn to let go of my hold on them. How do I learn that? I learn that by grace. Grace teaches me. Grace empowers me to let go of what's already been taken care of when Jesus said it is finished because either it was finished or it wasn't. Let's have a Pentecostal fit and run around the room just because of how good Jesus is. And he broke it all so that we could complete and fulfill holiness in the fear of God. That means I will find grace to bring holiness to completion. What has already begun by the work of Christ, I will co-labor with to bring it to completion and fruition in my life. In my life. So holiness is, here's, here's the thing with the message of holiness. So often the church then has let fear crept into, man, if I don't perform to a certain way and to a certain standard, then I'm not going to be accepted. Right? That's what religion has done to a pure message. It's tainted it. And because it was so tainted in that way, what happens is, is we swing the pendulum over here to a grace that has no power. 
So, so if y'all haven't heard this teaching in the body of Christ that's making grace something it's not, then you're blessed. If you have, then you might be having a hard time receiving what I'm saying today. But I'm just preaching the truth of the word of God today because I love you. Because I love you. <laughs> so holiness is not living. It, it's it, it, a pursuit of holiness. We don't live with the fear of being rejected by God or not accepted because of something we've done. But because we have been accepted, we're able to find grace to live holy because he's made us holy and we complete it with our effort. Here's the wonderful thing, man. Some, some people think, Pastor, my man, have you seen what's going on in culture, all this stuff? There's so much influence. Somebody come to the keyboard so I don't preach all afternoon. <laughs> have you seen everything that's going on in culture, Pastor Ryan? I mean, come on, it's like, it's a sex craze culture, it's a sin craze culture, it's selfishness and greed everywhere. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Romans chapter 5, verse 20 said, where sin did abound, grace abounds even more. The riches, the abundance of his grace that he made to overflow and abound to us wherever there's sin, grace is even more. Hallelujah. So the power of grace sets us free from being victims to sin. Trapped in cycles of addiction, doing things we don't want to do. Why? Because we've been chosen. We've been chosen. Man, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. Skip that. Let's say this. (laughs) Why is the message of holiness so important? Because it positions us to press new weight. Now, we don't get there except by grace, right? Except by grace. We don't get there except by grace. But finding grace and living holy strengthens me to press new weight versus the weakness of allowing sin, not issues, not mess ups, not mistakes, versus the issue of allowing sin to remain that weakens us. So, here's the thing. Grace isn't cheap. And if we want to be strong, we can't treat it as such. Grace works for me and salvation and every day becomes the day of salvation to walk out from any trap the enemy would lay for me. So listen, this isn't bad news. This isn't hard news. This is good news. Jesus set us free from everything and made everything available to us so we can keep living free, so we can be more free than we've ever been. And there's no freedom like holiness. That's a Selah moment. Freedom isn't a license to do whatever. Freedom is found in holiness. Selah. Is there anybody that believes that today? Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. I messed up again this service. Man. Yeah, this, this mess up in a sin is just a mistake. I was supposed to make sure you had the emblems of communion before I started preaching. But the atmosphere was so good after worship, I just kept going. So we're about to receive these emblems of communion. And if you didn't receive them when you came in, would you just lift your hand so our ushers can serve you? Here's what we believe at Life Church that... Receiving the emblems of communion is an incredibly important part of our walk with Christ. And we don't believe that you have to be a member of Life Church to receive communion, but what we believe Scripture teaches is that you must be a member of the church. What do I mean by that? That you must have come to the place where you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that you have chosen to follow Him as Lord, and that You serve him as your savior. And so before we go any further, before we receive these emblems, I've talked about the power of God's grace to save you. Let me tell you what that means, that God was not willing that sin would keep man separate from him. He was so not willing for that to happen that he said he loved you so much. He loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And Jesus came and on the cross at Calvary, bore on himself your sin and my sin, the sin of all humanity, past, present, and future. 
so that sin could be removed out of the way and there would be a way for man to have relationship with God. See, God's not inviting you to come to him because you're bad. He's inviting you to come to him because he loves you. And he's not condemning you today. He's not angry with you today. He's actually madly in love with you. And he's so in love with you that he said, I'm going to make a way for them. And I'm going to extend my grace so that they can come into relationship with me. And with every eye closed, just for a minute, if you're here, you're in the sound of my voice, and you say, Pastor Ryan, today I want to come into a relationship with a God that loves me like that. And I want to give my heart, and I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my heart to him. Would you just lift up your hand wherever you're at? You'll join the ones in first service. Thank you, ma'am. You can put your hand down. Somebody else. I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. You'll join those that in first service did and the one that already has today. Come on, just lift up your hand. I'm going to wait for just a minute. You might not even understand what's happened in this service today, but you know something's going on in your heart. I want to tell you that is God drawing you to himself drawing you into relationship with him would you just respond to that draw on your heart by lifting your hand and say I, I want to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus Christ right now is there anybody else that will join this one this morning in this service hallelujah amen it was worth pausing for one but I want to give just another second for somebody else to respond just to lift your hand boldly and say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I believe when you lifted your hand, you said, you know what? I believe, I believe he's my Lord. Now I want to lead you in a confession of your mouth. And maybe you didn't raise your hand, but today you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I'm going to ask everyone to just repeat this prayer after me. And if you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, whether you lifted your hand or not, would you just pray this prayer from your heart and boldly make this declaration with me? Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. You died for me, and you rose again. I confess you as Lord of my life. I surrender my life to you. From this day forward, I'll serve you. I'll live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me of my sin and bringing me into relationship with the Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says that what just happened is you became a new creature in Christ Jesus. You became a son or a daughter of our Heavenly Father. And I want to say to you that prayed that prayer, welcome into the family of God. We believe you made the best decision you could ever make. Come on, would you just thank God? Come on. The Bible says that whenever we receive of these emblems, if you just get that emblem that represents his broken body, that little wafer thingy, that represents his broken body. You know, in itself, there's nothing holy about this. Hope I didn't offend anybody. It's an emblem. But Jesus said whenever we do this, it's supernatural. He said whenever we do this, we actually proclaim, we preach, we declare the Lord's death until he comes. And what's so exciting about telling about somebody's death? Well, it's usually a pretty sad thing except in this case. Because when we proclaim about Jesus' death, we're really proclaiming what his death accomplished for you and me. Like by his stripes, we were healed. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Come on, how, how, that he himself bore our sorrows and our griefs. 
proclaiming that today. You know what we're proclaiming? We're proclaiming that chains were broken when he died. We're proclaiming that the curse was broken when he died. We're proclaiming that we're free from the curse and therefore we won't be held captive to sin any longer. And I believe today as we receive these emblems, there is freedom that's going to be released in people's lives today because the chains were already broken. And I want to proclaim boldly by the authority of Jesus Christ and according to his word that as you receive these emblems today you're walking and will walk away from the chains that you've held on to so that you can be freer than you've ever been according to the power of his grace that has been extended towards you in Jesus name do you receive that by faith so Lord we thank you for your body that was broken for us we take this emblem And we let you know we're grateful for the body that was broken. And though there's nothing holy in it, we believe when we bless it and when it is blessed that it represents something supernaturally powerful that we partake of. And as we receive this, we recognize that we have become partakers of the very life of God that works in us and frees us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. course we know this represents the blood of Jesus I'm thankful for that blood there's power in the blood there's freedom because his blood was shed for us father thank you for the blood of Jesus today thank you that the blood of Jesus caused sin to lose its power and therefore it has no hold on us today we celebrate the life-giving flow of the blood. We believe there's life in the blood. Supernatural, God kind of resurrection life in the blood. We receive it today with thanksgiving in Jesus' name.